The company monitors its compliance and institutes corrective actions when it finds problems. Though there are standard uh, compliance regulations across the country, each state has its own laws. So it is to the company's benefit to make sure that these um, laws are uh, adhered to and the organization is compliant. So compliance signifies that you do at least the minimum necessary to stay in good standing. So if a company has been found violating the law, uh, the fines may not be as severe if you can demonstrate and show that you have a preventive and remedial compliance program uh, that is active and in place. So what are the types of compliance? There's external and internal compliance. External compliance, um, also known as regulatory compliance, refers to the measures a company takes to remain compliant within its industry standards, whether it's state or federal laws that are applicable. They are responses to the rules, standards, and regulations set for a particular industry outside of the company. Some industries are very highly regulated and require stricter compliance, uh, like healthcare and financial services. Uh, examples of those are compliance with HIPAA or the Bank Secrecy Act. Now, internal compliance, on the other hand, refers to the measures a, company's, uh, a company takes within its own business to set standards and maintain a certain level of quality and adhere to internal guidelines. So then what is a corporate compliance program? A corporate compliance program exists to ensure that an organization complies with any applicable laws or regulations. On a very basic level, uh, it's about education, prevention, detection, collaboration, and enforcement to ensure that the company is in good standing. It's essentially a system of processes, policies, and procedures, and controls that are developed and put in place to ensure compliance with all applicable rules, regulations, contracts, and policies governing the actions of the organizations, while keeping in mind the business needs and the industry standards. So then who needs these compliance programs? I would say in this day and age, every company, every business needs a compliance program, whether it's a formal or an informal one. Particularly private businesses, most private businesses, publicly traded companies, foundations, nonprofit organizations, government agencies, schools, a lot of whom are required to have a, a formal compliance program. So an effective compliance program must be a living, ongoing process that is an integral process of the organization which demonstrates commitment to its values and the ethics of the organization, as well as compliance with applicable laws and regulations. Now, Dilawar will discuss the elements that make a compliance program effective. Over to you, Dilawar. Thank you so much for uh, a brief introduction about the topic and what we're going to be discussing. So uh, as uh, everyone is aware that we are talking about compliance, so we have prepared a list, a small ingredient list of the key elements which are definitely needed for an effective compliance program. So to start off, I think it's very, very important to first identify what are those policies and those procedures which the company needs to put in place and not just identify them, the company needs to implement those policies and company needs to have those standard of conduct and those conduct should be told to the employees of the company or to the management of the company. Similar to that, uh, the second element of uh, effective compliance program is to designate a compliance officer. Uh, this compliance officer uh, can be a person in an HR or they can be a compliance community. Usually these committees exist in big companies or even in medium sized companies. So this make this entire process very streamlined. If there is a designated person, he knows what exactly has to be done. And if there's a committee which overlooks the entire compliance system, that makes life of uh, a lot of people a lot easier. So that's a very, very important thing. Another important thing is to train and educate. If you have these compliance programs, but your 
employees are not trained and are not educated about these rules and regulation which the company needs to follow then this entire program program of uh, effective compliance would fall apart so it's really really important to ensure that your employees as well as your management is trained and educated about these procedures policies and standard of conduct uh and how you can ensure that your employees and your management is trained and educated that can be done through effective communication have regular follow ups have regular training sessions have properly communicate information to your employees properly communicate information to the upper management of what has to be done and how it has to be done and when it has to be done and not just putting in these procedure not just implementing them it's also very much advisable to have a system of monitoring like this entire compliance program is redundant if there is no monitoring because obviously people do forget about rules they need to be told and they need to be monitored and if someone is not complying in the organization or if one department is not complying with the procedures you need to identify them and you need to tell them that wait this is how it is supposed to be run so annual audits quarterly monitoring system or monthly monitoring systems are really really important then there should be some disciplinary guidelines of this procedure essentially entails that the employees and the management should be told that if they are not taking the steps which are required to take there will be some disciplinary actions and they should be told about those actions those consequences beforehand so if they do make a mistake they should know they this is the liability which they can be exposed to then the last and the most key a uh, factor in making a compliance program effective is to detect uh, what and when and where some offenses are taking place whether you are complying with the employment laws whether you are complying with intellectual property laws whether you are complying with even covid laws and if you are not complying if your company is not complying the most important step to make sure that this entire program is effective is to have corrective mechanisms and corrective actions let your let your employees know let your management know that if something is done in such a manner what can be the steps which they can take to rectify their mistakes and how they can correct it so i think this is the theme of our uh, presentation today and we will be building more on this uh, sub topics thank you the lover that was very comprehensive Uh, so as the lava was um, mentioning earlier monitoring and auditing is a very important aspect um, of a compliance program uh, we can then discuss um, more about audits so what is a compliance audit um, so if we look at compliance it often involves strategic discussions about where the business is going what it needs to achieve its objectives uh, in a compliant way so it's more forward thinking and preventive while an audit takes these so same objectives and looks back to see if they were achieved in the way that they were meant to be so basically a compliance audit is an evaluation that finds out whether a company is following both internal as well as the industry related state and federal laws and regulations generally compliance audits are carried out by regulatory agencies or hired third parties uh, that uh, send over compliance auditors On the other hand there are internal audits that are performed by the company's own compliance officers or designated employees who act as internal auditors and observe all departments for compliance and risk assessment. So um what is what constitutes a successful compliance audit and what are the uh, some of the considerations that companies um can look at for an audit to be successful? knowledge of operations um so the management should know the extent of their operations and should know the legal risks they might face in case of non compliance being honest about the compliance requirements will help to implement long term compliance measures and contingency plans for any eventualities um and it's important that uh, active compliance management is maintained so it's not just good enough to form an internal audit committee and leave the compliance management to them instead 
the management to, should take an active role in ensuring compliance across the board. Um, further, they should develop a compliance plan and put in put things in place that provide continuous compliance training for all employees. Uh, developing a compliance culture is important. Uh, becoming compliant starts with adopting a culture that runs on the ideals of accountability and integrity. Management should instill values and a code of ethics that prevents non-compliance, uh, non-compliant activities from the start. Furthermore, if they can implement incentive programs for anyone who successfully follows these compliance procedures and is, is in line with this culture, that becomes an added incentive. Training for compliance, as Tilawar had earlier mentioned, is another important aspect. Uh, the compliance requirements shouldn't just exist within the operational level. Management needs to train every employee at every level on compliant practices that are applicable to them when uh, implementing operational changes into effect. Additionally, they should also have an onboarding plan that includes dedicated compliance training for all employees. Establishing a compliance program is not just sufficient, but managing that compliance program is also important. Um, so it, it's not just, like I said, it's not just enough to form an internal audit committee and leave the compliance management to them. The management should take active steps and um, ensure that this is all uh, done in a, in a proper way. Uh, training um, for compliance establishing managing management systems these are while these are all important there is extensive preparation that also takes place during an audit um, during before and after an audit auditing can involve both written questionnaires in-person inspections interviews and observations so gauging the evaluation needs of an audit and preparing in advance by selecting participants, setting expectations, and providing adequate reference criteria to meet these requirements is very important. Um, also, uh, setting controls in place is an, an important aspect. So even if you have prepared for the audit in ways that you could, chances are they, that an audit might reveal some vulnerabilities or legal risks that you had not anticipated. Uh, to um, minimize that risk or to counter that, uh, develop an audit control plan with contingencies and risk aversion strategies for each perceived risk. Additionally, conduct um, regular internal audits to identify risk areas and um, take feedback from uh, the employees that are, um, you know, doing this kind of work on a daily or daily, weekly or monthly basis. So all these are successful components of a compliance audit that might um, help the audit process become a little more um, streamlined and easier to manage. Uh, we will be looking into the various areas of compliance requirements for businesses. Uh, we'll start with filing requirements. So the, so the most important step to ensure that an organization is in good standing with the State Department is to ensure that it is up to date on all their annual report statements or biennial statement filings as is required by that concerned state law. So these annual reports or biennial statements are a way of letting the state division know that the entity is currently operating within that state and um, is currently conducting business there as well. So these annual reports must be filed, um, as the name suggests, must be filed once every year and can reflect any changes in the address of the business, any contact information or stock information of the entity. And while most states uh, do require these reports to be filed once a year, there are a few states that require um, these to be filed once every two years, such as New York requires a biennial statement, which is to be filed every other year. Uh, along with these annual reports, there is a filing fee associated. Uh, the filing fees are mentioned for a few states are mentioned in the slide uh, in front of you. Along with the filing fees, some states also have the requirement of a franchise tax. So this franchise tax is basically a fee that is paid to the state uh, for the privilege of operating as a corporation in that state. 
uh delaware is one such state that does impose a franchise tax on its um on the entities that operate within delaware and are incorporated in delaware and uh, the formula that is um employed to calculate this franchise tax is usually based on the business revenue of the entity and the number of its authorized shares and the par value of their shares Aside from uh, annual report, franchise tax, and biennial statements, there are also a few states that require an initial report. So when a compliance audit is being conducted uh, for a business that is uh, incorporated in such a state that requires an initial report, it is very important that it is filed. Initial reports, uh, just like annual reports, require information such as the name of the registered agent of the business, the address of the registered agent, uh, the working address of the business, and uh, a few states also require a list of the officers, members, and the addresses of these officers, members, and directors of the business. So these filing requirements are one of the most important areas of compliance that need to be checked uh, because if a corporation or an entity does not file their um, annual reports for a prolonged time, they tend to lose what is called their good standing within their state. And uh, the consequence of losing a uh, good standing in the state could result in um, maybe temporary suspension of the registration of the corporation. It could also result in uh, administrative dissolution or uh, revocation of the registration. All these uh, consequences will result in the business losing all its benefits of being incorporated within that state. So uh, examples of this could be they would no longer have the standing to sue within that state for any reason whatsoever, or um, they will not be operating legally within that state once uh, their registration has been revoked. Uh, moving on uh, to amendment of articles of incorporation and formation. This is also within the scope of filing requirements because uh, when there have been important changes to a company, such as the amendment of a purpose clause or a removal of director, these changes also need to be reflected on their um, articles of incorporation or certificate of formation uh, of this business entity. So while filing for this amendment, uh, most states, uh, such as Delaware also, require that a shareholder's resolution and a director's resolution be passed by the business, uh, authorizing these changes to the entity. So uh, aside from filing for the amendment, it is also important for the entity to keep records of the meetings of their shareholders and directors and act in compliance with the bylaws of the entity. So uh, acting in compliance with the bylaws of the entity is usually an area that is explored during an internal um, audit, but it's advisable to make sure that the business is uh, operating within the scope of its bylaws um, during a corporate compliance by a third party as well. Uh, aside from these state filings, uh, it's necessary that the business also ensures that all its federal tax obligations have been met with and all its income and employer taxes have been paid with the IRS. Uh, there may be certain sales taxes that are imposed on these businesses uh, by the state, so these also need to be complied with. Uh, further on, there are other federal regulations regarding um, healthcare coverage provided to the employees, such as the Affordable Care Act. Uh, all this needs to be reviewed. All the healthcare provided to their employees need to be reviewed to ensure that the business is compliant. Uh, these areas can also be covered in a tax-related compliance audit, uh, not on, but it can be overviewed during a corporate compliance audit as well. Uh, lastly, if the business does have any federal licenses, any state licenses, permits, business, um, any business certificates, these need to be kept up to date as well. A few states have um, provisions where a business license does expire um, or does have to be renewed every two years. So the businesses need to ensure that they are up to date on these renewals as well. So we usually um, provide our clients with a corporate compliance calendar 
that lists out the dates and deadlines for these uh, filings and all the details that will be required um, for these filings and uh, what are the documents they need to keep handy for these filings. So these businesses are aware and all these dates are incorporated on their calendar as well. So uh, the next compliance area would be to review uh, contracts, invoices, agreements of the business. So most businesses and most entities usually have a generic template or an agreement uh, of an agreement that they use to enter into uh, businesses with other, um, to enter into transactions and uh, businesses with other parties. However, these templates must be reviewed frequently to ensure that the interests of uh, the business are always well protected and that these um, contracts and agreements are in compliance with the evolving laws. So a few important um, provisions to look for in these agreements could include the confiden uh, confidentiality provisions. This is to determine um, if the other party will have access to this business's um, confidential information. And if so, uh, confidential information and also intellectual property, any access to patented um, uh, patented information or so on. And if they do have access to such information, it is important to ensure that this confidentiality provision is ironclad and uh, also to ensure that you know this confidential information of the business is not being decimated uh, without the consent of the business. Another provision to be look uh, to be looked at is the remedies provision. Um, this is to ensure that necessary mechanisms are put in place in case of uh, breach of this contract or agreement. Uh, here the auditor can explore ways to limit the liability of the business and also determine what types of remedies can be included in case there's a default by the other party and uh, ensure that uh, the business being audited is in its interests are being placed um, first. Uh, then, of course, uh, we look at causes for termination. What would be the causes for terminating the contract? And it's not just necessary for cause. Uh, check if there is a, a clause that allows um, termination for convenience of the business as well. A resolution provision is also very important to determine um, if it is in the best interest of the business. Uh, it's necessary that they have an arbitration or a mediation requirement, uh, which could save the business lots of time and money. And uh, if there is the need to go to a court, uh, check if the venue of the uh, litigation is convenient and appropriate for this business. Aside from um, while reviewing these contracts and agreements, uh, it is important to go over the incorporated documents as well, such as the appendix or addendums or any schedules to these agreements that may impose additional obligations and responsibilities uh, on the business being audited. So ultimately, the goal of reviewing uh, these contracts is to identify all these obligations and responsibilities that the agreements are currently imposing on the business. And uh, once these responsibilities have been identified, the auditor must relay them to the person in charge of the entity in a very logical and um, streamlined manner to ensure that they, are be they were being fulfilled and will continue being fulfilled and also to recommend any changes that can be used for further, for future uh, transactions and businesses. So uh, that is all from my end. Uh, the lover will be speaking about the other areas of compliance and how to identify them. Um, on to you, the lover. I would like to speak uh, more about employment law compliance, intellectual property compliance, uh, COVID related compliance, and what steps uh, small businesses should take uh, to ensure that they are compliant with all these compliances. So starting off with uh, employment compliance, this is a big area and usually is uh, a lot of big concern for our clients. So starting off, what do small businesses or medium-sized businesses need to have, or even any kind of business need to have in place? The first and the foremost thing is that they need to have policies and procedures. And they need to document those policies and procedure in a format which is readily available to their employees. We, in legal terminology, call it employee handbook. This employee handbook contains all the policies, 
of the business um, such as employment uh, such as harassment policies termination policies um in, in health insurance policies and things like that so it is really really important for businesses to have that kind of uh, employee handbook in place which they should give to all the new hires and all the uh, already existing employees and they should not just have this employee handbook but they should constantly revise this handbook and make it compliant with the new state and federal laws so it's really really important for us to advise our clients to have first a handbook in place which should contain all the policies which the business wants it employs to comply with and secondly they should regularly update and revise these uh, th this employee handbook and make it compliant with the state and federal laws secondly uh, another important a uh, factor which uh, businesses need to take care of is to distinguish between exempt employees and non-exempt employees for those of you who do not know the differentiation exempt employees are those employees who are not entitled to overtime uh, while the non-exempt employees are those who are entitled to overtime and if they work overtime they should be paid according to the labor fair labor standard act uh so it's really really important for businesses to have this kind of differentiation in place uh, so that they know which employee needs to be paid over time and they're not confusing the exempt and non-exempt employees uh another aspect about employment law is to make sure that the employees are taking proper meal uh time offs uh and they are being provided time to have lunches or have breaks and not just providing those big but it is also very important to document those uh, meal times uh, then at the, all the businesses all the companies who have employees it's really really important for them to have a pto policy a paid time off policy and this policy should be governed by each state and federal law uh, wherever the company is uh, being incorporated and wherever it is conducting its business so this sh the company should make sure that they are comply they complying with the state laws as well as the federal laws and are providing uh, adequate paid time off to their employees lastly and most importantly i believe that these laws and regulations keep evolving and what as an employer you should uh, what as an what employees should employers should do is that they should update their policies and how they can now they cannot send the entire handbook out to all the employees every month if they are making a small change in policy what they should instead do is that they should uh, make small pamphlets or brochures and probably paste them in the office so that everyone can acquaint themselves with the new policies and now that there is during covid time not many employees are work coming uh, coming to the office and working remotely so it's really important that during these times um hr teams should send out emails and should send out these updated regulation laws about new policies and should keep the employees updated so this was a very small brief uh, bit about uh, employment law now i would like to jump to the intellectual property so uh talking about uh, intellectual property uh it's also very very important for business uh, business owners to protect their uh, intellectual property and first in order to first in order to protect intellectual property business owners should be aware of what is intellectual property and needs to identify what are the kinds of intellectual property so like logos of the business advertising slogans business names they should be trademarked uh similar to that if um, any businesses in a, for example any businesses and any companies in a business of music they should probably uh, copyright their music um then if some business is uh, has some trade secrets or like uh, formulas like pharmaceutical companies and uh, others like uh, big uh, 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 big motor vehicle companies who have like designs and all they can patent it so it's first very important to identify what kind of intellectual property each business holds and then they need to properly file those uh, Uh, intellectual property applications like trademark copyright patent with USPTO uh, that is the United States Patent and Trademark Office 
and not just file them, but they should also ensure that these application, these filings are current and live, which means that the renewal filings should be done uh, on timely basis and should not be missed. The deadlines for renewing trademarks or patents should not be missed. Uh, similar to that, whenever we, we come across this a lot, when like our clients are engaging with other businesses or third parties, they are reluctant to how we can ensure that the information is protected or the secrets are protected. In such scenarios, we always advise our clients and um, I'm sure everyone here who is a legal practitioner or a lawyer would also advise that to have an NDA in place. An NDA is a non-disclosure agreement which basically restrict uh, third parties who are interacting with you or other businesses which are interacting with you to not disclose your secret information or your trade secrets to anyone else uh, outside. Uh, and I think this is very, very important for any kind of business to have in place like a general or a specific NDA uh, which they can use uh, whenever they're interacting with other businesses or third parties. It will not just protect their intellectual property, but it will also make sure that the intellectual property is not being used or used for any illegal uh, purpose or anything like that. So now uh, jumping on to COVID related compliance. Uh, so COVID related compliance, and I think this is uh, one of my favorite areas uh, because we have recently been asked a lot by our clients whether the employees should wear a mask or not. And I must say that this question has come to me so many times that even when I'm working from home, I feel like wearing a mask. So <laughs> this question of wearing a mask, whether the companies can mandate uh, their employees to wear a mask or whether companies can ask now that vaccination is out, can they mandate uh, the employees to have the vaccination? Uh, this is a question and uh, a lot of clients of ours have asked it. So uh, as per the federal laws, yes, employers can mandate their employees uh, do, uh, in the office to wear a mask. Plus, they can also mandate uh, uh, the employees to have the vaccination if they're coming to uh, if they're coming to the office or if they're doing the work in the office. Uh, however, there's a caveat to it. Uh, the, the caveat is that if for some reason the employee cannot wear a mask due to, let's suppose, some health issues or some health restrictions, they cannot wear a mask or cannot get a vaccination, um, then reasonable accommodation should be provided by the employers to those employees. And these reasonable accommodation can be like allowing them to work from home, uh, giving them some time off or like giving them a space where they can just sit separately. Uh, so things like that can be reasonable accommodations. However, it should also be noticed that if these reasonable accommodations are unduly burdening the company or the business, then the employer can take steps to probably ask those employees to leave or and for that instance they can give them more PTOs or things like that. So yeah, the 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 basic idea is that these reasonable restrictions should not unduly burden the business. Uh, more importantly and lastly, uh, it's also very important for during this COVID time that the businesses should provide proper sanitation materials to all its employees like hand sanitizers, uh, gloves, uh, shields, uh, so that they can protect themselves and the others in the workplace. So now we are moving to the last bit of our presentation. Uh, first and foremost, uh, and I think this is a very, very important point for all of us to notice over here is that what are the common examples of workplace litigation? They include uh, personal injury, uh, actions like let's suppose uh, you have an employee and he gets injured uh, in the office uh, and he can have a claim against you how can you avoid that uh, similarly if, um, if if a non-exempt employee is not being paid over time he can have a claim against you and for that instance if someone is being discriminated at a workplace or being harassed they can have a complaint against you. And uh, similarly, if someone is being terminated and they can they can probably say, oh, they were wrongfully terminated. So how do we advise our clients to make sure that they, you know, uh, develop a system where they can avoid these kind of uh, potential litigation? 
the first and the foremost is to train your workforce tell them about tolerance tell them about discrimination how they can avoid discrimination how they can avoid this harassment at workplace have proper trainings uh, and if someone still do not adhere to those trainings and do not adhere to those principles publicly discipline them so that these those people who are not following the rules and regulation they can be an example for the rest uh, and whenever they are facing the consequences so it's very important to foster a productive and cooperative work environment and most of these issues can be mitigated second is uh, to ensure compliance regulations we we usually come across that a lot of small businesses or even medium sized businesses are not really aware of the federal and state compliance regulations and the reason is that because they do not have legal knowledge or they do not really read up these are the regulations which your business needs to comply with these are the rules these are the laws which you should follow and i at times come across those kind of clients which are not compliant with hipaa which are not com- which are not complying with the cobra law which are not providing health insurance to their workers this is really important and if they do not do that they can fall into some kind of trouble later at some point uh then it's uh, it's really really important and essential for any business to have prudent vigilant and a good hr guidance if you have good hr as a company i think all of these issues related to compliance can be mitigated if your hr is vigilant they know what they're doing they have the proper procedures in place you can as a company avoid a lot of trouble uh and and whenever there is an hr usually hr ensures that there is proper paperwork administration whenever there is a new hire they they should ensure that like you know the employment agreement is executed properly and is being recorded properly and is being documented properly uh it's not just kept in hard copies it should also be kept in soft copies so that whenever there is an issue later at some later stage they can go back they do not have to uh you know find it and files they should have it handy so these these are these are small things but at times they do create a lot of big hassle for the for small businesses or even medium sized businesses so it's really really important for those kind of businesses to coordinate their uh, hr initiatives uh similarly uh, building on that it's it's really really important for the hr to coordinate all of these processes if there is an hr and they are doing like most of the big companies uh do have like those softwares link should be missing if a single link is missing it can create problems for them later when the audit is being done so they must ensure that all the chain the entire chain is there and nothing is missing from it uh the last two points are very important and uh, i think uh, these were the main ideas throughout our presentation the the fact is the first is that there should be an annual training for all personal members it's really really important to train people forget so it's really important that you continuously train your uh, your workforce and your upper management let them know that this is this is how things should be done this is these are the procedures what we are going to lay out in our workforce and this is how they are going to be implemented what can be the repercussions if they do not follow those uh, if these these trainings are conducted regularly on regular basis there there are very good chances that you will easily pass the audits and your company will be compliant with the new laws uh, similarly the last important bit about this entire uh, presentation is that they should implement a comprehensive system of monitoring recording and documentation of corporate information uh, as i have already built up on that earlier it's really really important for corporations and companies to have their documentation and information recorded properly uh, because even if a small documentation is missing it can create risk and it will not let you pass the audit stage and when the auditing is done it can raise red flags and these red flags can say oh probably there was a fraud which was being done or if not a fraud there was some misconduct 
internal misconduct been happening in the organization so to avoid all those kind of things and all those kinds of instances it is really really important to follow each of this step in a logical and chronological manner uh with this i would like to thank you dilawar great job on um, giving the varied aspects that are applicable to businesses thank you everyone for joining in thank you thank you thank you everyone